Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this conversation on banned books and editorial censorship in defense of the LGBTQ liter literature. Here in Oklahoma and across the country, educators and public libraries are under increasingly attacks for, from conservatives who are challenging books that center the experiences of our most marginalized voices. So I'd like to extend my thanks to PEN America for hosting this important discussion and to our community partners, Magic City Books, Fulton Street Books and Coffee, the Black Wall Street Times. The work that you all do to inform and provide access to our community here in Tulsa is paramount. As the folks at Fulton Street put it, in the summer of 2020, book sales on race and racial injustice skyrocketed as folks sought to understand through books the root of our nation's racial unrest. The conservative response to a nation attempting to reckon with its past and present trauma has been to simply ban the books. And this dangerous form of censorship poses an imminent threat to our democracy. I'm Ryan Fitzgibbon, I'll be moderating. I'm the founder and publisher of the LGBTQ magazine, Hello Mister. I'm a current fellow with the Tulsa Artist Fellowship and an advocate for independent journalism. With me today are Mike Curato and William Johnson. Mike Curato is the author and illustrator of everyone's favorite polka dotted elephant, Little Elliot. His debut title, Lil, Little Elliot, Big City, released in 2014 to critical acclaim, has won several awards and has been translated into over 10 languages. Mike's debut young adult graphic novel, Flamer, uh, was awarded the 2020 Lambda Literary Award for LGBTQ Young Adult and the 2021 Massachusetts Book Award for Middle Grade Young Adult. In a novel brimming with humanity, Flamer follows protagonist Aiden Navarro. It's the summer between middle school and high school, and Navarro is away at camp. Everyone is going through changes, but for Navarro, the stakes feel even higher as he navigates friendships, deals with bullies, and spends time with Elias, a boy he can't stop thinking about. He finds himself on a path of self-discovery and acceptance. William Johnson is the Penn Across America Program Director at Penn America. A longtime steward in the writing community, Johnson was the editor and publisher of Mary Literary, a magazine committed to showcasing LGBTQ work of artistic integrity. He also co-produced Ne Panlanta, a journal dedicated to queer poets of color, the first major anthology for queer poets of color in the United States. In 2011, Johnson began his tenure at Lambda Literary, an organization dedicated to promoting LGBTQ literature. As the deputy director of Lambda Literary, Johnson oversaw many of the organization's most dynamic programs and public events. So welcome, Mike and William. All right, hello everyone. I am really excited uh, to be in conversation um, with you both. Um, just to start off, now I work at PEN America. I am the director of the PEN Across America program. So I work with our stakeholders across the country to cultivate literary engagement and to fight for um, free expression. So I, unfortunately, I have the honor of starting off this conversation with some sour news. Um, I, but I do think it's important just to um, frame this conversation and give you an overview of what's actually happening in terms of book bans um, around the country and both regionally in Tulsa. Um, uh, from 2021 to 2022, um, Penn has recorded uh, 2,532 instances of individual books that were banned, affecting 1,648 unique book titles by 1,261 different authors. So these bans occurred in 138 school districts in 32 states. Uh, these districts represent 4,049, um, 49 schools um, with a combined enrollment of 4 million students. Um, among the, the 1,648 um, unique titles banned, excuse the data dump, but I think this is really important, 41% of those books were ex explicitly addressed LGBTQ themes or have protagonists or prominent secondary characters who are LGBTQ. 
And among those titles, uh, Sally, Mike, your book has received unsettling scrutiny um, in the crusade to ban LGBTQ books. Uh, in Tulsa in particular, Flamers was one of the two novels that State Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, Joy High Hofmeister, asked to be removed from the Tulsa Public Schools. Joy said in a press conference that she reached out to Tulsa Public Schools and called for, for your book to be removed immediately. So that's the environment. This is where we are. Yeah. Uh, thanks for setting that stage for us, William. Uh, to everyone listening in, uh, if you have any questions, please add them as we're about to get started um, into the Q&A box, um, and we will make sure to go through those and get to those a little bit later. Um, okay, so I'm going to open this discussion um, by reading a quote from Mike when uh, he unveiled Flamer in 2020. I'm trying to remember the first time someone called me a faggot. It's happened so many times that I can't pinpoint when it started. It still hurts. The best revenge I've come up with is to make a book about being a faggot and how it's nothing to be ashamed about. I want all the little faggots out there to, to know that they are loved and to wear their faggotry like a crown. We are queens after all. We are not dirty we are, and we are not sinners for being gay. We sin when we believe the lies that are perpetuated against us. We sin when we apologize for being here. I sinned when I didn't want to give myself a chance because I didn't think I was worth anything. This story is my penance and my redemption. Wow, thank you so much for that, Mike. My inner little faggot definitely appreciates that. Can you talk a bit more about your drive and? Uh, to create this book and also the importance of representation for young readers. Yeah, um, well, thank you, William and Ryan, for having me. Um, you know, it's, it's no surprise that we have a severe lack of representation um, in literature in America, um, but especially in children's literature. And when I say children's literature, that um, is an umbrella term for um, books made for people ages, you know, one through uh, 20-ish, right? Um, so it's picture books, middle grade, young adult. Um, and anyway, uh, I, I started out in the industry making picture books mentioned Little Elliot. Um, and uh, I really believe strongly in um, the importance of, of picture books. Um, but there were, there were things that I wanted to talk about um, that I didn't see on, on shelves. I didn't see myself when I was growing up in books, um, on TV and film. Um, who did I have to look to? Uh, to let me know that I was okay. I had no mirror, as they say, um, to see myself in. Uh, I was a, a chubby, uh, mixed Filipino white kid. Uh, I was very effeminate. Um, and I was harassed on the daily about that. Um, you know, and, and, and raised very Catholic, uh, went to Catholic school. Um, so someone like me, right, who doesn't see themselves represented and is told so openly and often that there's something wrong with you, you start to believe those things, as I said in that passage that you read. Um, and at a certain point, you know, I started to question, like, why am I here? Like, am I even supposed to be here? Um, and you know, it was a rocky road um, and I did struggle with suicidal ideation when I was a teenager. Uh, and I, by the grace of God, made it through that. And, um, you know, I feel a lot more comfortable in my skin since I came out, which wasn't until like senior year of college um, and found my community and found people that loved me in a holistic way. 
Uh, so I feel very safe now, but I know that there are uh, lots of youth out there who are struggling with the same experience that I was. And, you know, making a book is what I can do um, for them. And that's why I wrote Flamer. And that's why I will continue to write uh, queer books for kids and for adults. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. And thank you for that answer. I think that, you know, representation is so important as well in that it uh, opens up conversations as well. And so what these book bans are doing are not only taking that possibility away from having genuine conversations about our peers and people in our classrooms, but it also in a lot of ways lays the groundwork, it does lay the groundwork for bullying and more violence to happen yeah. for marginalized people as well. And so that's obviously, you know, a big part. And thank you so much for the vulnerability and they're sharing that and in this book as well. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, it's it's really, these bannings are creating a hostile environment, right? It's just making matters matters worse because, you know, it's it's uh, a little more overt than just a dog whistle. It's telling the bullies like, no, you're right. These people are freaks. Go ahead, go to town. Um, and I just, I don't understand people who get behind the bands and they're like, we have to protect the children. Let's take, let's take these books away. And it's like, no, you're putting children in even more danger. You're putting people at risk through these bands and they just refuse to <laughs> open their eyes to that, um, which is the most infuriating part of it. it. You know, the whole, we need to protect our children uh, story. Right. Um, Cause it's just not, that's not what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, um, for both of you, I mean, are there any memorable messages that really stand out that you've received from readers or participants in projects of yours? I know, speaking from experience, it's, you know, creating a magazine for over the last, you know, since 2012 when I started it, so many, and, it, and it's really heartwarming, but also can be really overwhelming too, to receive a lot of what the content of the, these messages are, but will any that stand out to you? Well, you know, I don't know if it's, I mean, this is a situation I think is, is important to talk about because, you know, it, these book bans create shame. And, you know, I am like 49 years old, right? I'm out to my whole family. And yet still I'm like, I'm doing an event in a couple of days in Detroit about LGBTQ blackness and literature. My father is from Detroit. It's like, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come and bring all my friends, all your old, like your old barber, your dentist is coming. Like, you know, all these folks are gonna be coming. Your, you know, your, your auntie's coming. And I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't tell him the topic, but even now in this position, like I'm a public homosexual, but there's still <laughs> this feeling of like shame to tell my dad, um, this is a gay event. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like, I've been out, but there was that feeling of shame and it continues. And that's what this, these book bands do. Um, despite, you know, who you are, if the culture tells you you're wrong, it's, it's still hard to get over that shame. Right. Um, so there's that aspect of it, um, despite all of that. So I, that's why I know how dangerous it is, even for, like for teenagers in middle schools and, and elementary schools, why it's so important to kind of lift that shame. Because even at 49, I can, it's still, runs through my veins. So I think that's important to note. Um, but in terms of feedback, um, you know, I get messages from folks, thank you for the work you do, it's incredible. And it's just like, it enlivens me to do this work. Um, because you get messages from folks who are in some of these places that are, the, the challenges are vast. And to know that, that you're making connection, it's important to have that lifeline to know that that you know, we exist and folks exist who are doing this work. Um, when I hear people like say, and I'm sure Mike has more examples than me, I get a couple, but it does kind of like push me forward to continue to do this and continue to fight. Yeah, I, um, I have a few, I, I won't read all of them, but 
Um, here's one, and this, this is from a, a teen. Um, I finished your book. It is so touching. This is my favorite book. I felt like you and I can relate to, oh, wait, sorry. I felt like I knew you and I can relate to your book in some ways. It makes me feel like I'm not the only one. And I mean, that's really why I want my book out there because there are so many people who feel so alone, who, you know, they're, they're in the closet or maybe they are brave enough to come out in a community that doesn't fully accept them and they feel really isolated and, you know, a book can be a life raft for someone um, in that vulnerable position. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I've heard from adults who tell me like, this was my life. Um, the book is set in 1995. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've heard from grownups who are like, I've never felt seen in a book before. Um, I've even heard from uh, like two people who, I mean, or were just like me, just like Aiden, like also Filipino, in the Scouts, really Catholic, you know, chubby, like all these things. And you know, one of them's like, what? <laughs> what were you doing in my journals? You know, like, what? <laughs> get out of my head. Um, so, but that was really meaningful to me to, I mean, I was really moved reading that because I was like thinking about how alone I felt as a kid but I didn't know, if only I knew, right, that somewhere uh, like across the country, there was someone just like me going through the same thing. And that would have been such a boon to me to know like, okay, I'm actually not out here on my own. And it's just a matter of finding each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree. I, I related in a lot of ways. I was a chubby uh, Catholic altar boy in Boy Scouts. And um, interestingly, I received like an early copy of your book um, back in, I think, 2019, or as soon as as soon as it was started uh, sending around to publishers. And, you know, throughout the moves, I moved out to, I was in Brooklyn at the time, I moved out to Tulsa and the beginning of 2020. And the book made its way with me. Not a lot of books did, because, you know, moving mm -hmm. around so much, like it's hard to travel with all of the books that we want to keep. Um, but this one came with me and it's just really um, beautiful and serendipitous that we're having this conversation now. Um, and I, I so appreciate it. And um, yeah, adults alike. Um, I mean, with, with Hello Mister, so many coming out stories, people uh, really like sharing and so much with me that um, only, I kept, I always said that, you know, I didn't get paid much or you know, working in independent publishing, but that was the fuel that kept me going, and it was my source of income. Um, but in relation to you know students too, I read this quote recently from a, a, a student in Texas um, talking about a, a book ban, and they said, you know, it felt like my identity was uh, seen as dangerous because of the banning of a story like that. But what about my story? Am I seen as a bad influence or something that I should be that should be shamed? Um, you know, it's so deeply internalized too, when this stuff is, you know, people, conservatives are out there, you know, banning and pushing this agenda. Uh, yeah, so very much appreciate you and this conversation. And I um, think it's really important that more stories are told and um, we find ways to publish more. Um, I, yeah, so it re was released two years ago, Flamer, right? Almost to, to the month, right? Um, yeah, it, yeah, it was in that. September, mm -hmm. September yeah. 15th. What's today? Oh my goodness. 21st. Okay, we're just a few days. Yeah, past. Well, so launching a book during COVID made, yeah, thank, congratulations. Um, <laughs> it meant not having like a traditional book tour or, or you know, what you probably had expected because I, had heard that you had been working on this book for almost 10 years, um, you know, in, in conception, right? So um, how the, the politicization too of books in the classrooms has also reignited, obviously, this discussion around books. So can you talk about 
um, how you've navigated the the last two years um, and how it feels now, I guess, to be still, you know, talking about this. I mean, it's, I guess, yeah, it's I'm, great for the book. I mean, it's, it's been an interesting time for publishing these last two years. Um, so the pandemic really threw all of us for a loop, obviously. Um, I think, uh, I think we did pretty well. Like, you know, the publicity team at Macmillan did an amazing job and um, we just really leaned into doing virtual events and like people, it was still early-ish, early enough that people didn't have like Zoom fatigue for like virtual events yet. Um, it was just kind of like, oh yeah, well, that's what there is to do. So, um, so there, we did have some good engagement um, at the start of things, um, but I, I really haven't gone on tour for this book. Like I haven't uh, gone around the country, but I've, you know, been on people's computer screens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so really it's just been a lot of online engagement. And I think that there was an interesting phenomenon that happened during uh, the pandemic with graphic novels, um, which, you know, just, just a few years before uh, the pandemic hit, they suddenly were being appreciated for the, you know, the literature that they really are and not just as like, oh, it's a comic book, uh, that comics in general, you know, are now being uh, seen, having their moment um, as literature. Um, so kind of writing that, uh, I think I've, I've heard discussion of how during lockdown, you know, people wanted to read, but also they, you know, everyone was just a little like overwhelmed and like maybe some people didn't feel like they had the bandwidth to even like sit with a, a regular novel and that having something more pictorial could kind of be like, okay, I can, I can do this. Um, so graphic novels uh, continued and to rise in popularity um, is what word on the street is <laughs> that I've heard. Uh, during the pandemic. So I think I'm very lucky in that sense uh, that, you know, those combinations kept the book afloat and then it started to get more um, recognition via uh, like review periodicals and um, people talking about it uh, in a positive light in the news and, um, you know, in getting some awards that helped spread the news. Um, and so everything was kind of all good the first year uh, that the book was out. Um, it was just, it was just always good news. And then, um, you know, and then that list in Texas, and I was like, oh, there it is. Here we go, America. Uh, and yeah, it's just now, whenever it's in the news, it's in, you know, it's under this shadow, which is a shame. Um, and I just, more than anything, I, I'm just really worried um, about, you know, the youth in this country and how they're being affected by that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the book is still here. It is not going anywhere. I have a lot of support from my publisher. Um, they've really gotten behind it uh, and behind me. Um, yeah, so just to reassure people that like, you know, e even if it does get banned from a school district, uh, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> right, right. Well, how has being implicated in these recent debates like caused you to rethink or recalibrate this central mission of your work? Has it inspired new projects? Has, have you um, yeah, anything you can share or mm -hmm. you want to share on that topic? I mean, honestly, all this has just gone to show how necessary these books are um, and just reaffirms my dedication to making them. Uh, so yes, I will continue to make really gay books. Um, I signed a book deal this year for my first adult graphic novel, 
um, called Gaysians, which centers the gay Asian American experience. Um, you know, I mean, we, I, I just feel like I just want to put things on the shelf that I I want to read, you know, um, and I don't have that book, so I'm making it. Um, and I have uh, another secret project that hasn't been announced yet. Um, so stay tuned. Um, I'll just say I will be also moving into the middle grade arena. Uh, so yeah, Eddie Pie Hands, I'm gonna be <laughs> in all the genres, all the age groups. Amazing. We're, we're so glad that you are. Um, I wanna talk a bit about sort of um, actions, right? And sort of how uh, we've seen forms of dissent like with organizers at local levels pushing back and, and nationally. And I think William, you'll have a lot to offer here. Um, but what are some of the, the examples that you've seen? Um, you know, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the successful models I've seen, this happened last fall, which actually seems like a, another world from then. It was kind of right when this all was bubbling up, you know, it's, it felt like it was bad, but now it just feels like it's really um, ballooned. Um, but there was a school in Pennsylvania, I think it's called um, Central York High School, and it was the students. The students, like, were basically banging pots and pans going to the school board meetings, getting allies, getting community allies, and it got a lot of press. Um, and that press um, caused the school system to rethink their plans. So what these students did was they, you know, they built, um, they built coalitions, they made their voices heard, they went to the school board meetings, and these are things that everyone should do you know, I mean, they, they have, a, basically that's the guidebook on kind of um, facing these censorous threats. Mm -hmm. Build coalitions, go to um, the school board meetings, tell folks how these bans affect you. Write to the, you know, local, local representatives, call them, call the press, get the attention. Um, they did the work. And it worked and it's kind of like the model mm -hmm. um, that I think a lot of folks can use moving forward. Yeah, it's been really inspiring to see student involvement. Um, there's a group of students uh, in Katy ISD in Texas. Um, and when they, when their school was faced with bans and, and a bunch of books did get banned um, as many schools in Texas have had bannings, um, they, they organized their own book drive. They solicited publishers, they got donations, and they distributed books themselves to people who needed them um, to make sure that the books were available to their community. Um, and they did, they were able to get some of the books reinstated also, um, maybe under certain terms, like you need permission or something like that. But still, a lot of the books were returned to the shelf. Um, and then I, I hear really great news in other communities, like there was a, a town meeting um, in New Hampshire last week, I think, um, where a board member was go just gonna bring it to the floor about banning books. And so they were having a vote about whether or not it should even be discussed. And people just like turned out, right? Like the, the township just showed up and they were just like, hell no, like, no. And the council voted like, uh, I don't remember how many were sitting on the council, but it was everyone except the one person who wanted to bring it up. And the issue was just shut down from the jump, right? So it, it really, um, this is really where speaking out in your own community really matters. And if you don't know what's going on right now in your community, I encourage everyone to like, you know, check in, uh, see what's up, talk to your, your librarians, your librarians know so many things. <laughs> I love librarians. <laughs> yeah, there's some really great resources uh, with the Banned Books Club, um, bannedbooksbookclub.com. Um, 
And I saw in there, there's a kids right to read action toolkit, which is really awesome. Um, and reminded me, so, you know, teachers and parents alike, check that out. Um, but uh, reminded me that I saw there was a discussion guide on, um, on your website for Flamer. And I think that's even just a great thing to include to sort of have prompts and, and have questions for, you know, people to talk about books more openly. Um, because I, you know, I often feel like in these debates, a lot of people who are uh, attempting to ban them haven't even actually read them. Um, or absolutely you know, not. Yeah, see, like a, an image of you know one of the paid the spreads of your um, graphic novel, or you know, see a, a couple of lines and deem it uh, inappropriate. So and, and not and not even that. You know, they they just there's a list that goes around and folks just pick it up and just say, hey, right. these are these mm -hmm. are these are the books that you need to be removed. Right. Yeah, it's very right. that COVID. Uh, I did my own research situation where they found something on the internet and just ran with it. Mm -hmm. um, just on that, do you think you would uh, update or add anything to the discussion prompts like now, knowing you know? Um, and having more conversations about the book? Um, honestly, that's a great question and makes me want to reread those questions. Um, and I was full transparency, <laughs> my publisher created those questions. Um, you know, people with school library background created those questions. So uh, that is worth talking about. So uh, TBD, I guess. <laughs> that's great, it helped me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Cool, thank you. Yeah, what what can, I mean, we kind of covered this, I, I guess, but any other uh, references or um, sources for folks listening to do to get involved in their communities? Uh, I know Magic City Books is offering uh, signs for the Brooklyn Library um, QR code to have in your front lawn to have access to the banned books. Um, oh yeah, maybe we should explain. So like the Brooklyn Public Library announced recently that anyone in America can check out books from Brooklyn Public Library. You don't need to be a New York City resident. Um, FYI. Yeah. <laughs> and I would tell people also to um, the American Library Association is a great resource, pen.org. Mm -hmm. um, we have several toolkits um, for both readers and librarians and writers. Um, to navigate some of these difficult spaces, which often take a lot of bravery. Mm -hmm. So um, I do need to say that this is not easy work, um, particularly in some communities, but um, reach out, particularly also if you're an author, reach out to Penn um, and we have some resources for folks. Yeah, speaking of Penn, um, I know this is your gig, William, but I just, I just read the really comprehensive report that you all just published. Um, and it's really thorough and I think it's really interesting when it drills into like, who are these groups that are trying to get books banned and why? And um, and then I was, I was reading something the other day just talking about, or no, it was, uh, it was on Twitter. Just, you know, people will tag me in things and just hearing about uh, something in a, you know, local school board meeting talking about like, well, the uh, school board voted to keep your book last year, but this year they got all this PAC funding uh, and board members were replaced and now it's banned. So um, it's, it's not just parents getting involved, just to remind people like it really is a political issue and there's political uh, funding. Um, you know, behind some of this organ organizing um, and they are organized. Uh, so it's important to be aware of, <laughs> of uh, the powers that be in your community. Yeah, I, I mean, this, our updated report really calls out explicitly, you know, Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, uh, Basically, fascist organizations who are doing organ who are doing this kind of, you know, anti-blackness, anti-queer. This is now their arena in the school board, seating the school boards, passing out um, these lists amongst each other. Um, 
so yeah, it is organized and we have some catching up to do. Um, but yet again, I'm emboldened by the, the pushback that we're starting to see and the movement that is starting to happen. Right. Well, it's officially, the sun is officially set in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as you can see. <laughs> I know, is it like, is this like, it's now it's like, like zoom it's like, after dark, it's like, yeah. okay. The night, the, the, it's, <laughs> it's the um, sand timer, like in real time, organic um, countdown. But I'll, I'll use this really cheesy transition to talk more about um, kind of how, uh, you know, as even... Well, I think there's a couple of things like obviously as writers and authors sort of working through this work and the work that we're all doing um, to keep, you know, fighting for this um, and defending literature, um, you know, that's one side of the equation, but also what sort of resources and advice do you have for young adults who are dealing with questions of identity and struggling to, to find acceptance? Because um, I think that's a really important uh, part of this conversation that I don't want to miss because of the theme is, is quite daunting sometimes. Well, I'd just like to start by saying uh, one thing that I don't hear about when my book is banned and the reasons behind it is that no one feels the need to mention that the book is about suicidal ideation and um, over overcoming that. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that that's not mentioned, I think is not a coincidence. Um, uh, so, you know, I think, oh, sorry, I just wanted to share a resource before anything. Um, the Trevor Project is a uh, suicide hotline um, that is specifically for queer LGBTQ youth. Um, it's 24 seven um, and even if you're, you know, uh, if you have questions about suicide or even questions about coming out and navigating um, being out, they have a lot of resources on their on their website. Um, I think it's just trevorproject.org. Um, and it's also in the in the back of the book if you have it. Um, so anyway, uh, but I wanted to bring it up just because, you know, there are people out there, even if you are feeling alone that really care, you know? I mean, I think I can say that like William, Brian and I just like really want everyone to like stay with us, you know? I mean, we really need you. So, um, and if you are out and proud, I mean, uh, I think it's really important for, for all of us to be involved in our queer communities um, and let people know like, you're around, you care, you want them around. Um, and this is a time that we need to support each other. Um, so yeah, I, I just keep coming back to community because you know I think ultimately that is what um, what did save me uh, was like you know even just having one really good friend uh, can make such a difference in someone's life. Um, yeah. Uh, was there more? <laughs> well, I would just, yeah, I would just add, and thank you for that, add that, you know, it's also really um, imperative that we campaign and vote for people to be in office who are going to advocate for access to our books too. So it's a really important mm -hmm. um, part as we enter into this next year. Um, yeah, I, um, we can open it up for some questions. I, I've got, uh, we've got some time and have one in here if you want me to get into that. I have one question for everyone before yeah. we get into, so I have a question because I'm, I'm also nosy. Um, yet again, attendees, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, but what book, when you were young, were you, your, your touchstones? Um, because, you know, I came out through literature. I know some folks don't anymore, but I, often there's still a book that is a touchstone for folks. So I'm interested um, Ryan and Mike, what was your, what is your, and could still be your touchstone, your touchstone queer book? I mean, I didn't really read queer books as a teen um, or even as a young adult. I think it was maybe a year or two after I came out that I even 
read like a gay book. Uh, maybe I watched, you know, like gay cinema and stuff and film. But what what does lean queer for me in a lot of ways um, are the X Men. Uh, I was like a huge X Men comic fan, and I just, you know, it's very. Um, I feel like it can be very coded at times. It's like, you know, like, oh, you know, here's this fabulous person with all these powers and abilities, but everybody hates them, but they're going to do the right thing anyway. Um, and they're a bunch of outcasts and they like look amazing. So I don't know. It's just like, yeah, that. Um, and I didn't really think about the parallels, right, um, of being gay and being an X-Men or X-person. Uh, until I was older and I was like, ah. <laughs> um, so I had that, but it wasn't until I was, you know, an adult that I really got into, you know, reading queer literature. So um, I think the first really gay book I read was The Velvet Rage. And I'm blanking on the author's name right now, but I just felt very validated after reading it, I must have read it in my early 20s um, or mid 20s, something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I similarly was actually really um, into a lot of uh, comics and graphic novels and was just really, you know, also didn't, you know, didn't have any references of queer um, characters and content, but was always queering things that I was reading. Um, and so I can relate in that way, um, totally to that. What about you, William? Do you have a... I mean, you know, we could have a whole other discussion to talk about the queer <laughs> aesthetics of the X-Men. I mean, I talk about the, okay. the, the melodrama, the strong Where's my protagonist. The, I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh, the melodrama, the feelings, so many gay feelings. Um, so that's a whole other, so yes. The X Men when I was very, um, very, very um, um, kind of like young in middle school, um, but as I got probably in high school, um, you know, I didn't know about queer YA, so I worked at a library, so I would steal like all the gay books. This is terrible. I'm sorry, librarians, but I the shame part. So I would steal all the books out the library, and one book um, was. Uh, it was Edmund White's, what is it, A Boy's Own Story? I think that's the name of it, um, was the book that I kind of found. And was like, oh, this is a thing. This is a life. Um, mm -hmm. And it gave me kind of like a possible path to move forward. But it was very adult. And there's a lot of things I didn't understand. But I probably still don't understand. And I am an adult. Um, but it did kind of um, show me the way. Yeah, I mean, no surprise. I was very into like magazines early on and was hiding whatever I could find you know amongst piles of other things that I would find at, at Barnes and Noble in my hometown um, and was just kind of trying to reach and aspire to you know these quote-unquote lifestyles and and uh, things that I could glean from whatever wasn't censored um, that that was available to me and I think access is super important and having you know more spaces and um, opportunities to reach more kids is great. So uh, let's let's have some questions. How about uh, okay? So the superintendent describes Flamer um, as quote it's pornography. Um, so what has been signified as pornography in this book? Um, please to provide any details and any citations. Sure. Um, and, and people love to take this out of context, right? Um, there is a scene in the book um, where the main character is in a tent with other scouts and realizes, you know, he doesn't realize this when he goes in there, but realizes at some point, like, these guys are masturbating. Okay. And the main character who is the gay one in the book, everyone else is straight. He feels really awkward and ends up leaving the tent. Um, 
and you don't actually see anything happen. Everything's kind of inferred. And there's like a small section where Aiden talks about masturbation. Um, that's the pornography. Uh, that's what people are like, ah, like freaking out about. Um, and I don't know how to explain to people, um, teenage boys like experiment, you know? Um, and yeah, <laughs> is it an uncomfortable topic to bring up? Absolutely. Why do I feel the need to? Because that's real life. And um, sexuality in this country is so taboo. Talking about sex, like the, like even just acknowledging like, you know, young people are starting to have sexual feelings. I mean, if it were in a straight book and someone's having sexual feelings, I feel like it wouldn't be as, uh, as taboo. Um, but I just feel like, we need to be able to acknowledge that these things happen and you know validate that uh, stumbling into sexual situations for the first time is scary and confusing and brings up a lot of feelings. Um, and that is why I <laughs> brought it into the book um, because it is adding to uh, Aiden's confusion and um because he doesn't feel safe in that environment because he realizes like I think I might like guys and what if they know and and then what you know like am I in danger here um because I've been in a situation like that as a teenager um and yeah I didn't feel safe and right. I left as soon as I could. Um, so other than that, you know, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I mentioned like he talks about masturbation and there's another image of him uh, where it's kind of like inferred that he might be masturbating. Um, but he's also talking about it in a really frank way about how he like kind of stumbled upon what that even was. Um, so, I, I don't, I don't know. I guess my question is why, why can't we acknowledge that young people experience these really awkward moments? Um, and instead of placing, you know, shame on, on this thing beyond the book, like, why can't we just be like, okay, this is a thing that happens and doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, it's, I get really flustered about it because in shaming that scene of the book, we're shaming teen sexuality. And <laughs> I still get worked up thinking about how much I, I hated myself for having sexual feelings when I was a teenager, right? Because I'm supposed to be good. I'm supposed to be pure. I'm supposed to not have these feelings, but they are human urges, right? And I didn't do anything wrong. Like I can, I can see that now. Um, and I think that's where we get into an ideological tango. Um, Right. Because there's some people who don't believe that, you know, uh, there are some people that believe that masturbation is a sin, I'll say. Um, and so now we have this conflict of like people bringing their religious ideologies into the public library space. Um, so where is the line there? Where is the line of like, because legally, <laughs> legally, a teenager has done nothing wrong, right? If they do something like that. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the big hullabaloo. Um, and again, 
everything else gets sidelined because of that one moment of the book. And it's a very easy thing to screenshot on, you know, or not screenshot, take a photo of um, and post online, but like, look at this, you know, this filth that they're sharing or, there's another scene um, people love to post where um, people are, are in a shower, right? So it's like one of those giant communal showers and Aiden walks in and Aiden, again, <laughs> the, the gay one, while everyone else is straight, everyone's naked except Aiden who is wearing a bathing suit because he's scared to death to be naked in front of everyone. Again, something I experienced, um, you know, I had a lot of body dysmorphia. I still struggle with body dysmorphia. A lot of shame about um, then about my size and um, and I, I was embarrassed, right? Like I didn't want anyone to see my genitals. So that's the context of that scene. It's not gratuitous. It's not like Aiden walks in and is like, oh yeah, nice. Um, and it's awkward for him, right? There's a, there's another part of the of that scene where he's showering, and um, his friend drops the soap. He goes to give him the soap, and then Aiden realizes like he's getting aroused again. You don't see that. It's like you know we can read his thought process, and he's like, "Oh my God, what's happening to me? I have to get out of here!" And he like runs. So it's like they're adding shame on top of the shame that Aiden's trying to process, right? And I'm just trying to validate like, it's okay, you're okay. Like it's a normal, natural thing. And um, I don't know, I just feel <laughs> um, really defensive for, for Aiden and for my younger self and for people who have experienced something like that. Um, so to me, um, these scenes are about navigating um, awkward, embarrassing moments, not about gratuitous sexual arousal in the reader. Um, and you know, that's, that's a hard difference between what I make and pornography. Um, so the, I mean, I can tell you the only <laughs> remotely, uh, you can't even say it's sexual. The only like physical thing that Aiden does with another boy is he gives his crush a kiss on the cheek. Spoiler alert. Um, that's it. That's all that Aiden does physically with someone else. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about that, but. Uh, no, very thoughtful and beautiful and very affirming um, as the book is. So um, well said, thank you. Um, perhaps one more and then, and then we can close it up. So um, living in a city where the book bans aren't so prevalent, what are the best ways to reach out and support communities that are under attack with these bans? Well, I mean, I, you know, on this, and I think there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can reach out to national organizations who are doing the work and support them, um, like the American Library Association, like PIN, um, see what ways you can support um, the work. Also reach out to communities that you know may be in need and you see and you may hear about folks who are doing the work on the ground. Um, there may be ways you can support them. Um, so if, if you find a way to connect with some of these groups, ask, what can I do from whatever city you are in to support you, what you were doing on the ground there? Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. It may mean giving money, giving books, asking you to come out to help them, like organize, write a letter, do whatever. Um, so those are the two things that I can think of off the, off the top of my head. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I mean, I think, yeah, uh, acknowledging and thanking our community partners again, Magic City Books, Fulton Street Books and Coffee, and the Black Wall Street Times are all three 
great resources as well to follow, get involved, and support. Um, and thank you to Pan America. And thank you, William. And thank you, Mike, for this really beautiful and important conversation. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. I obviously have to go read myself a bedtime story because it is real dark <laughs> over here. <laughs> Good night, moon, for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll take it. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. So that was really special. <laughs>